Let's get right to it. We're going to be in the Old Testament this morning. My favorite division of the Bible. I'm a history guy. So I like to uh, backtrack when Christ has not yet been revealed. We're going to be in the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, and 2 Samuel. <laughs> Second Samuel could be right after First Samuel. Amen. We're going to be in chapter 5. If you could rise on your feet in reverence to the reading of God's Word. As we have some soft music playing in the background. Second Samuel chapter 5 verses 1 is where we're going to start. It says this. I'm sorry, is everyone all together? Do we need a moment? Amen. Sounds like we're together. Second Samuel chapter 5 verse 1. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone and flesh. In times past when Saul was king over us, it was you who led out and brought in Israel. And the Lord said to you, You shall be shepherd of my people Israel, and you shall be prince over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. Can you say amen? amen. As you reach across the aisles and grab your neighbor by the hand, I'd like to talk to you today about the calling of a king. The calling of a king. Heavenly Father, thank you for this gathering of your people. Thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you that we can come to a place that might transform our mind and transform our bodies and transform our spirits and transform our heart and transform our life. God, thank you for your word, the only instrument that is truly capable of transforming us. Father, so pour into us now, pour into me, Lord, so that I might communicate your word effectively yes. to these, your children. Father, hide me behind the veil, Lord God, that they might only see and hear from you. Father, we're ever so grateful just to be in your presence, and we ask that you be with us during this time. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. 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 David is a fairly popular, fairly regularly preached uh, historical figure in the Bible. Uh, King David, as it says in Scripture, reigned for 40 years. And a lot of the biblical stories that have been ingrained into our head come from this guy. He is all over the place. The 40 years of his reign and also, more importantly, the time in his life leading up is heavily, heavily documented I feel it may be because, as the scripture says, that he is a man after God's own heart, that we get such insight. And often, I think, when we look at someone biographically uh, through the lens of their work, uh, a person of power, a person of historical significance, we typically will look at them from the time they came into a certain position or the time that they come into power. Amen? We fail sometimes to look back over their life. Let's, let's talk about our current president. A lot of us can tell us just about everything that our president has done from the time he took office eight years ago until this time. But how many of us can give us more introspective look into his life prior to Inauguration Day? Amen. Amen. If you're anything like me, I'm a history guy, I'm a how-to guy. I want to know what he was like when he was a kid, you know? What gave Abraham Lincoln the guts and the glory and the gusto to be able to lead this country into a, a bloody civil war that lasted years and years and took hundreds of thousands of lives? You know, what was he doing growing up, or what was he like in his formative years? We can talk about Moses, you know. We know Moses from the Exodus. He led an entire nation out of slavery, crossed a Red Sea, but what... What was Moses like before that? Amen. 
I think we get a false perspective sometimes of people that they woke up one day and they're an overnight success. That there wasn't anything formative, there wasn't anything that happened to these people before the limelight came on and before the reporters started reporting on their story. Are you all tracking with me? So all I wanted to do this morning, and God led me to do this, is just take a look back over David's life prior to our focus scripture. Here we have the glorious moment. Here we have the moment where he is anointed by the elders to be king over Israel, the powerhouse of the time. But I want to take a look back. And so all we're going to do is just backtrack through a handful of chapters. I'll give you some scriptures. You can write them down and we're going to be out of here. Is that okay? So we're actually going to start back in 1 Samuel. We're going to be in 1 Samuel 15, 10 through 11. And it says this. The word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry and he cried to the Lord all night. So, historical context. Oh, we're just going to kind of talk this morning. Is that okay? By the way, I'm not going to do a lot of shouting and screaming. We're just, we're just going to get through this and, and have a little teaching session this morning. Samuel is the prophet for which these books are named after, First and Second Samuel. He is someone that is led to uh, communicate on behalf of the Lord to the people. That is what a prophet is. Now, Saul is the king that preceded David. So what we have here is that Saul has fallen from grace with the Lord. Saul has fallen out of favor. Saul has been disobedient and therefore is going to be removed from office. There's going to be a job posting shortly on Monster in Israel. Amen. <laughs> Make sure y'all still away. Y'all was kind of zoning out on me a little bit. So the first thing that's important to know about the calling of a king or even the calling of you is that there will be room made for you in advance. There is a position waiting with your name on it. There is a calling that is specific to your life and there's already been a chair set for you on the throne for my king's and queens in the room, there is a chair that has your name on it that only you can fill. That is a definition of calling. Calling is a unique work that can only be completed by you. That's why you can't comment too much and we can't share too much about our callings and compare our callings with one another because your calling is different than your calling and my calling is different than your calling and all of these things because there's a spot that God has prepared in advance. Now, David's not even on the scene yet. David is not yet mentioned in Scripture when this is happening. He's not brought up until the next chapter, until all the preparations have been made, until the spot is becoming available, and God is looking at his roster, and he's saying, who is it going to be? Who is it going to be? And he set forth a seat for David as king. Let's go further. So, after room is made for us, is when we receive our call. This is when David received his call. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 16. So the next chapter, and just a little bit of backdrop. Some of you all have heard this story before, but if you haven't, here's just a brief Cliff Notes view of it. This is when Saul is sent by the Lord to Jesse. Jesse is a Bethlehemite. He is from Bethel. He has a handful of sons of whom David is one of them. You all know the story. Samuel comes before Jesse and he said, line up all of your sons because the Lord says that there is a king amongst them. Can you imagine being Jesse? Like, I knew this was going to pay off one day. I was tough on them boys. You got me a king. We go. Moving on up. That's a show from the 70s. If you want to go there. It's not in the scripture. It's not in the scripture. Back here. Back here. So Samuel's talking to Jesse, and one by one, the sons come through. And Jesse's like, God is, no, next. God, well, what about this? No, next. You know, the big, strong, you know, handsome guys, you know, coming forth, and surely this must be the one that you're calling. And God's like, no. And so Samuel's sitting there, and he's like, well, who, who else? I've gone through, and he asked Jesse, he's like, Jesse, you got any more boys in the work? Because God said it's one of your sons 
But we've gone through all something. He's like, oh, we got a little small one in the back. We're gonna go grab him. It's just David. He's tending the sheep. This is this is that story. So in, in 1 Samuel 16, 13, it says, Samuel called him forth. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. God has given you his seal of approval. Though there might be many people in line waiting to hear that they've been promoted and that they've made it and that this is for them, God already has your seal of approval. And he did it with David when he anointed him with the oil. And it says that the spirit of God from that day forth was with him. He was called specifically by God after there was room. So this is the exciting point. This is when we all get excited. If anyone in here has ever heard God say something to you, we tend to get a little pumped up at this point. We're like, man, let me tell you, Pastor, what God told me. And we get going. And God tells David, it's not recorded in Scripture. I'm making this up, but it happened. <laughs> God tells David and tells Samuel. Samuel anoints him. He's like, great. We'll be back for you. And he leaves. David's like, wait a minute. I just got anointed king, and I got to go back and work with these sheep? <laughs> he didn't say that. Pastor, he didn't say that. He didn't say that. But can you imagine receiving that word from God? And it's just like in our lives. We'll receive a word from God sometimes, and we get all pumped up this, that, and the other. We go to bed, wake up in the morning, and wonder why we're not walking in it yet. Understand this about your call. Your call and what God has for you is not immediately realized. You've been chosen. You are in where you need to be. But sometimes you're not going to wake up in the morning and be where you thought you would be. When you're called by God, there's still work to do. There's still things you need to see. There's still things that you need to experience before you can walk into destiny. David wasn't ready to be king. He was going to be king. He was going to be king, but today is not your day. So let me encourage you. Let me share a word with my brothers and sisters in Christ that God has given you the message. You're not going crazy. You heard it properly, but today may not be the day. Today is coming, but it's not today. Hold fast. God's like, I got you. Just stay right here. Just like a backup quarterback. Just stay right here. You're going in. You're going in. You're coming in. You're going in. Just stand right here next to me. Stand right here. Don't go. Anybody that's ever played sports and you are a backup, that's how the coach does, right? Coach grabs you and says, Mac, don't go nowhere. Stay right here next to me because you're going in. Stay right here next to me. You're going in, Mac. And God will hold you right there. And Mac's just quaking in his boots. He's like, I want to go hit somebody. I want to go shoot the basket. Come on, coach. Let me get in. And God's like, you're not ready. You're not ready. Just stay stay next to me. Stay, stay with me. Stay right here. You're going in. Don't worry. God calls you, but it's not going to be immediately realized. It happened in David's life. It happens in our lives. Can you say amen? Amen. amen? Now, when the time is right, when God says, okay, let's start putting this in motion, God will position you. Thank you, God. God will position you in such a way that it's undeniable that it's God. So what happens next in David's story, again, David's not king yet. God's told him he's been king. He's been anointed by the prophet. Room has been made, but he's not king yet. But he says, I'm getting ready to position you for where you're going. Do you want to see the scripture that says this? We scroll to chapter 16, verse 14, just down a little bit. I need to read this all to you so that it makes sense what I'm doing. It says, now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. We talked about that, right? Fell from grace. And a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. Wait a minute. <laughs> a harmful spirit from who? The Lord. the Lord. God will boot people out of your way when they're in your position. He will make sure... This ain't even my point right now. But he will make sure that someone is uncomfortable in your chair. This is not your chair anymore, Saul. So I've got it for David. David's coming up, so I'm going to make you uncomfortable. It says, and Saul's servant said to him, Behold, now a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. 
Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. Saul said, yeah, that sounds good. Provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. One of the men answered, behold, I've seen a son of Jesse. A son of Jesse, a Bethlehemite, that is skillful. And he's young, but he knows that he's a man of valor. Let me go to Jesse's house and get him. So again, Jesse gets this visitor, one of King Saul's servants, and he says to him, I'm here for David. He's been summoned to the palace. He's been summoned by the king to the palace. God put David in the very palace in which he would inhabit as king. But he positioned him there as a servant to the current king. Let me tell you that God will put you in the place where you need to be. And you need to be patient and you need to stand there and you need to follow directions. There's a reason you are where you are right now and you're not running the show. There's a reason because God's like, you got it, don't worry about it. But listen to what else he says. Once David gets there, Saul heard him play the instrument, and it calmed his spirit. And he said, sent a message to Jesse, he said, let David remain at my service, for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the instrument and played with his hands. Saul was so refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. Not only will God position you, but he will make you indispensable where you're going. Yes. David was the only one that could get the spirit away from Saul. Can you imagine him kick Saul kicking David out? No, that's not happening. God will give you a seat of permanence where you're going. He'll give you a seat of permanence in the palace of which you're going to rule over. So just stay there and play the instrument. Stay there and stir. Stay there and do anything that God would have you to do where you are because your turn is coming. You've been positioned. You are in the place you need to be. So we continue on with David's story. And we have another when the time is right moment. Have you all heard the story of David and Goliath? Yes. A couple people? Yes. So here's what's happening now. David's at the palace. He's doing his thing. Saul is still king. However, the Israelites are at war with the Philistines. And David is summoned to the battlefield where King Saul and the rest of the Israelites are hiding and ducking from this monster Goliath. He is the warrior of warriors of the Philistines. Scripture records him to be over seven feet tall. He was a monster. And all Goliath wants to do is kill one man. He said, here's how we're going to settle this, talking to the Israelites and yelling from the other side of the battlefield. He's like, you sent me your greatest warrior. And I'll do battle with him. And whoever wins, wins the battle. No more bloodshed, no nothing. So this is where we are in the Bible. David shows up on the scene to deliver some food from Jesse's house, his father, to his brothers. He shows up on the scene and he's like, well, what are y'all doing? <laughs> They're laid up in the, in the ditch, hiding from, like, who's going to fight this guy? And Saul's like, get down, get down, get down. You see this crazy man's over here, and he's throwing spears, he's cursing. I'm sure he cursed. They don't cuss in the Bible. I'm sure he was cursing, some four-letter words, real bad ones. <laughs> and he's yelling across the battlefield, and David's just like, well, I'll do it. So Saul is like, no, 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 you stay here. Da, 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 da. We're not doing that. We're not going to that. You're too small. You're just a boy. Don't let people put you in their idea of where you should be. Amen. That's a little side note. Don't let somebody tell you because you're white or because you're black or because you're a woman or because you're short or tall or heavy or skinny that you can't do what God has told you to do. One of the things a king is called to do is to wage war. And since David's been anointed a king by God and by Samuel, no, I'm made for this. I'm made to do battle. So finally, David's like, look, I'm doing this. David gets put out there. And it's an impossible situation from the outside looking in. I can't say I blame Saul for what he did. David's put out there, and David's a boy. 
I'm six foot tall. I'm just saying David's like here. Seven feet tall is like up here. Do you imagine a guy this big trying to fight somebody this big? It's impossible. David grabs three stones. Y'all know the story. Slings them, kills Goliath, goes, cuts off his head, steals his armor, send, you know, he, all this stuff. The Philistines run off. Israel wraps them and kills much, many more of them. So what God did when the time was right was that he promoted David. He promoted David to be the chief warrior. It was also given the reward of being able to marry Saul's daughter. So God put him in the position after he made room for him, and now he is promoting him to a position of prominence. It says in the scripture, in 1 Samuel 18, that as they were coming home from this battle, I'm still leading into him being promoted before man. As they were returning home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, and with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated. They said, Saul has struck down his thousands. David has struck down his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry, it says. Saul was displeased. This displeased him. He said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed thousands. And what more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day on. First off, side note, you want to get a man's confidence up? Get a bunch of women singing his name. <laughs> Second thing, you want to tear a man down? Get a bunch of women singing bad things about your name, man. That'll do the same thing. Amen, hallelujah. So in order for David, after he's been, room has been made for him, and after he's been called by God, and after he's been positioned, and after he's been promoted, David is now going to be persecuted. David is now going to have Saul trying to kill him just because he's already won the people. He's already won the men on the battlefield. Can you imagine being the one guy who took out the life? Everybody is on his side now. Saul, as it says, it says, and Saul eyed David from that day on. In order to walk into your calling, it comes with persecution. It comes with trouble. When you're achieving and when you're growing and when you're changing, other people's lack of change and lack of growth and lack of being able to progress in life is going to make them a little salty towards you. Saul was upset at David, and he, had, he was jealous. Yeah. Here this guy is doing things that I couldn't do, and here the people are promoting him before, before me, and what else can he do but take the kingdom from me? So he's like, oh no, we're going to, we're going to take care of this. And one time when David's playing his musical instrument, Saul tries to kill him. Throws a spear at him. Just did it disrespectful, like not even in his sleep. Well, the man's playing the instrument. You hired me to do this job, and you're trying to kill me while I'm working. Come on now. So the call, in order to walk into and become a king and queen and everything that God has called you to be, there's going to be persecution. Not only is David facing you know, these crazy odds out on the battlefield with Goliath, he's coming back, and he's getting persecuted in every sense of the word. He is getting hunted down by Saul and by his men. So much so that David had to retreat to the cave of Adalom. He got ran out of the palace, his rightful place. The place God had put him, the place that God had called him to be because he was fearful of what was going on in his life. I got to tell somebody in here right now, I think there's some people in this room that are in the cave right now. I think that there's some people that are hiding from what God has called you to do because they're fearful of how it looks right now. The persecution may be coming on you. The difficulties may be coming on you. You may be in a worse season of your life, but you're right on time with God. You're right where he needs you to be. He doesn't need you in the cave right now. He needs you out. Your call is for God. Your call is not in the cave. Your call is for the kingdom. Your call is to walk into the specific designed work that God has for you. So I said all I said today to get to this point if you're in the cave the kingdom needs you to come out the kingdom needs you to operate in the thing that God has told you about your life that you haven't even shared with someone else 
Everyone has received their call from God. You may not have realized it yet. You may not know it yet, but stick around. And if you have and you're going through a difficult season in your life right now, I'm challenging you right now to come out. Come out of the cave. Let God use you for what he's told you he wants to use you for. Your gifts are of no good in hiding. Your spiritual gifts, the thing that you know God has given to you as an ability to do. You may be doing them on your job right now. You may not. But there's something inside you that if you couldn't, if you didn't have to get paid or you didn't have to worry about bills or anything else, this is the thing that you would do with your life. What would you do with your life if money wasn't an object? What would you do with your life if you didn't have to fear for anything? What would you do? There's a good chance that this is a call on your life. It must be realized through scripture. Call pastor, call me. Let's, let's work it out. Let's vet it out. But there's some people, I just, I don't know why God sent me to the cave. I don't know why he sent me here, but he arrested me around the scripture. And I just believe that there's a handful of us in here that might be hiding from the call that God has given us. God has shared something with you, and God is going to give you everything he has because he's made room for you. He already knew. Before he told you, your seat was there, mother. Your seat was there. He positioned you. He called you out. He put you in the place that he needed you to be. You've overcome Goliath after Goliath after Goliath in your life. You've had difficulties that you haven't even shared with people yet. You have difficulties that you've endured and has kept you on track. Some have cheated death. Some have cheated financial ruin. Some have cheated illness for what God has called you to do. And you're still on track. No matter how windy the road gets, no matter the ups and the downs or the seasons that we go through. The last few times I've been up here, we've been talking about seasons. Let me encourage you that this is all part of the plan. God's hand never stopped being off of David, even when he was on the battlefield, even when Saul was hunting him down. And he hasn't forgotten you now. As you're struggling and stressing through the season of your life, know that God knows where you are. Know that God is going to hold your hand through it because he hasn't left you before. He will not forsake you. I don't know who this is for. I hope somebody's getting something out of this. So David hides himself in the cave. And in doing so, he hid every ounce of potential that he ever had. He hid everything that God had called him to be in a secluded area. If you're by yourself right now, I'm not even going to look at you. If you're by yourself right now, know that there's a group of believers around you, people that mean you well, that want you in their space, that want you to be out of the cave. The kingdom cannot benefit from what you have to offer. There are some brilliant people in this room right now. There are some people that God has placed so much potential in, but it's unrealized until we get into the process. It's unrealized as long as we're hiding out in the cave. It is unrealized as long as we're hiding from God. So I pray, I pray, I pray that you can link up with one of us. If this is you, link up with one of us so that we might be able to pray together about it. And we can start a process where you can come into the light and come out of the cave. Because you know what happened with David when he came out of the cave? There were some ups and downs and some danger and some peril. There's a lot of victories. He went on to win battle after battle after battle after battle. Mm -hmm. He conquered most of the world in that time. Biblically speaking, he outlasted Saul. It got so bad that David had the opportunity to kill Saul twice and he let him go because God said it wasn't time yet. God will deliver. God will deliver into your hands your enemies. But what ended up happening is Saul ended up falling on his own sword. Saul killed himself. And it was after that that David was, became king. But it wasn't until he got out of the cave. Didn't matter how much room was for David. It didn't matter uh, the call on David's life. It didn't matter that he had been positioned nor promoted all the victories against Goliath and all that. None of that would have mattered if he would have stayed in the cave. 
none of it would have mattered if he wouldn't have come out. Now, if you're in the cave, get yourself together. It actually says that his brothers and his, um, his father came to see about him. But a funny thing also happened. Everyone that says in Scripture, and I don't have this up here, everyone that was heavy burdened and debt laden and people that were having problems and the poor in spirit actually all flocked to David too. So while you're in the cave and you got some people around you, be mindful of who's coming around you because those might be the people, those might be the people that you're supposed to lead out. It says he became commander over them. All the people that came into the cave with him, he became commander over them and they went to be the strongest force that that time had known. This is when he started all of the conquering. This is when he started making the change. This is when he started his ascension to the king, to the throne. It was when he got himself together, got his team right and went out and killed it my brother my sister if this is you I'm praying for you if this is you and you're watching I'm praying that you have some folks around you right now that you can link up with if not I need you in this place more often so that we can do that so let's fellowship let's get together and let's go and grow yeah. yes. you can cut the video I'm about done family this is why the fellowship of the believers is so real this is why you can't walk in and walk out and not say nothing to nobody. This is why, as the people who are in here, when you see somebody doing that, you gotta call them up on it. You gotta go and grab them by the hand sometime. You gotta say, no, no, where you going? What you up to? What's going on in your life? What you need? Like, really? Let's pray. Let's and just be and just be the church. Just be the church. There, there's no you gain nothing. I gain nothing from asking Brenda how's her week going. Sorry, I lose nothing. I lose nothing by going and asking Melissa, what's going on? How's your brother? How's your mother? How's your family? I lose nothing. I may gain someone who gets grafted into this family, and I may gain someone that's going to help me do battle one time when I'm in my cave. Yeah. This is why the church exists. To save souls, but you can't save souls if you're not. Yeah. Come here. Come here, brother. Come here, sister. What do you need? What's going on with you right now? That's the only way you're going to be able to come out of the cave. Get grafted into this family. I'm done. Can we pray? Yeah. Did you all get something out of this? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, the Lord. Yeah. Let's pray. Grab somebody by the hand. Let's practice. <laughs> Grab somebody by the hand.